So thanks everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Brian Easter. I am the co-founder of Nebo. Uh, and obviously there's hashtag SNS15. Um, I will probably say uh, a lot of things that may or may not be tweetable. This is going to be more of a rant than a presentation, so uh, just want to forewarn everybody. A um, <clears throat> little bit about Nebo real quick. We're a full-service digital agency. We like to talk about you know, the fact that we're human-centered, located in Midtown. Um, basically, we you know, create human-centered digital experiences and do buyer journey marketing. Uh, we've won some awards, we have some great clients, blah, blah, blah. But we're not here to talk about Nebo. Um, first thing I want to talk about is I want to take a look back at history. Uh, these guys, uh, the British Empire. The British Empire is interesting because at one point, it was the largest uh, empire in the history of the world. Uh, you know the old saying that the sun never sets on the British Empire. Uh, they controlled, I think, something around uh, about 20% of the land mass in the world. Um, really started in the 1600s and went through the mid-19th century, 20th century. But it fell. The British Empire fell. It seemed like an impossibility to a certain degree. Um, but what happened? You know, the world changed. And they didn't realize it. You know, um, as I was doing some research for this presentation, it was interesting. People talk about, you know, GDP ratios, and they talk about, you know, overreach, and they talk about, you know, various leaders. But there was one big, huge elephant in the room. People wanted to be free. That was the lesson. You know, in 1776, when America became uh, independent, that even though the British Empire wasn't dead yet, and even though they didn't realize it, they were falling. And what had happened was there was a fundamental change in expectations of human beings. And by the mid 20th century, that had spread throughout the world. And that led to... Um, decolonization that led to uh, our world forever changing. So you're thinking, hey, I'm here at Supernova South. Why is he talking about the British Empire? Um, the reason I'm talking about that is because the world that we're living in doesn't exist anymore. Our world's changed too. As brands, as marketers, as advertisers, we're still doing the same stuff that we did uh, for a long time, the same ways. How many of you guys, you know, when you think about the buyer journey, how many of you guys are, are aware of the awareness, consideration, interest, purchase? And probably think about campaigns that way. Um, that was invented in 1897. And I stole this from one of my colleagues, Kim. Um, that, that buyer journey probably worked really well when you got on a horse and went to Woolworths um, to try to get something for your toothache. Um, but it's not reflective of our world. You know, and when we think of advertising, you know, when we think of the golden age of advertising, you know, we think of the 50s and the 60s, and, uh, you know, and, and brands and advertisers were trusted. You know, when I think it was a survey in the mid 60s, like they believed 75, the, the public believed 75% of what brands and advertisers said. You know, and part of it was because of amazing little like this. Why won't this play? Who walks the stair without a care and makes the happiest sounds? Bounce up and down just like a clown. Everyone knows it's Linky. The best present yet to give or get. The favorite all over town. The hit of the day when you're ready to play. Everyone knows it's Linky. It's Linky. It's Linky. For fun, it's the best of the toys. It's Linky. I won't 
go through that. I, I, I've watched this commercial now about 10 times and the Slinky songs like stuck in my head. But that's amazing when you think about it. It was pure, it was raw. It was, hey, it's a Slinky, right? But that's not the world of advertising that we have now. You know, and, and what worked in the past doesn't work anymore. And what's sad is we've lost the public's trust. Brands and advertisers aren't trusted and we have to overcome that. You know, we've done things where we've overpromised, where we talk about retargeting and we stalk somebody to death. You know, we, we do things like link building. We do things like uh, homepage takeovers. You know, uh, Comcast lies to us almost every day with a commercial. And so does DirecTV. I mean, you know, it's just like, wow. And, you know, th th when you think about, you know, the fact that we are spending billions of dollars to try to get our message out, but it's falling on deaf ears because they don't believe us. More importantly, or just as important, the cost of attentions went up. So in 1966, Star, uh, Star Trek made its debut. And when you were, if you were to buy a, you know, an ad, when you look at it from a CPM basis, and you look at inflation, the cost of a CPM and the rate of inflation you know, the cost of a CPM is outpacing that by 100%. So that means each year that goes by, we're having to pay more in real dollars just to get an, uh, an eyeball. And you combine that with the fact that we're exposed to like 5,000 ads a day um, that were social, that were multi-device, that we expect everything to be personalized, instantaneous, that you know we're about to enter this amazing world of the internet of things and smart apps and smart devices and smart everything you know information is at the consumer's fingertip and that means that buyer expectations and behaviors have changed um, we are not in a world where we were in 1965 or 1985 where we do a product uh, introduction where Folgers burst on the scene and all we have to do is buy tv radio and print Consumers don't need us. They have all the information at their fingertips. So it's a new world with a new buyer journey, and we're trying to hold on to this old world that doesn't exist anymore. So there's a couple things that this presentation does, and there's a couple things it doesn't. This is not a tactical plan to navigate the world in 2020 or to navigate the world where man and machine merge. This is sort of a new set of values, a new, a new philosophy. And the first thing that we have to do is get out of the marketing mindset. The marketing mindset, if you were to ask most people, implies manipulation. It implies overpromising. It implies, you know, not respecting the end user. You know, we're blasting people with ads. You know, and what's interesting, I said this is old, the world that we had doesn't exist anymore. You know, there's a term called banner blindness. How many of you guys have heard of that? So 8% of people click 95% of the ads. And you wonder how many of them really click those on purpose. They say half of all mobile clicks are a mistake. Yet, this is the world we live in. And then, you know, and we interrupt. You know, can you imagine if people, if you treated your neighbors the way marketers treat, you know, us? Can you imagine going knocking on your neighbor's door right during dinner and, you know, trying to, you know, sell them Tupperware or something? You know, this is, this is, this is crazy. You know, and, and, we, and we talk about like things like targeting. I've been in countless meetings with clients and with peers where, you know, you treat people like they're some spreadsheet entity. You know, they're this age, they're this, uh, they live here, you know, and then you, in the, in the manifestation of that, oftentimes is often user personas. I love user personas, don't get me wrong, but a lot of times they're sh short fiction and they're bullshit, you know, uh, you know, Sarah loves long walks on the beach. Uh, she's between 30 to 50. She loves her child. She values, you know, blah, 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 blah. That, 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 that doesn't hold, those things aren't valuable in this world. Those were valuable in the 90s. Those were valuable in the 80s when you were doing a direct mail piece and you're trying to, you know, target a certain, trying to, trying to actually get your information in front of somebody. You know, we need to start thinking in terms of empathy, sympathy, compassion, caring, committing. Those are the things that we have to think about how we're going to actually solve somebody's problem. And all of this leads brands to be really, really desperate for attention. Um, 
when I started looking for bad ads, there was no shortage of bad ads. Like the my, some of my favorite are local um, uh, auto commercials. Um, I have like 10 saved just in one folder because I just wanted to see them. But this one is um, pretty amazing. So, obviously, Guinness doesn't want that commercial uh, on YouTube anymore. Uh, I was lucky I was able to find it. But that's what happens when the things that we used to do in the past don't work anymore. We get desperate. We get desperate. And part of that is because we're viewing people. Come on. Um, we're viewing people as conversions. We will talk to clients, we'll talk to our peers, and what ends up happening is, is you get in this, these conversations where a user is a keyword, a user is a click. There's an actual human being that's making this decision. If you're a brand or you're a marketer, you should care. Um, I told you this is gonna be more of a rant, and I'm picking on car dealerships, but every weekend you're watching TV and there's some guy, Crazy Joe, and he's jumping up and down and they're balloons and he's telling you that there's some crazy special, you know, you get a rebate or you get a quarter percent interest reduction or it's the only place you can buy a Toyota in the entire world is in that dealership. And he's yelling, screaming, whatever. But right now there's a family in Kennesaw, Georgia that makes $60,000 a year that has two kids and they're thinking about buying a new truck. And that truck is gonna be a major life decision for them. That truck may end up being their son's first automobile. That truck is going to be something that they have to think about whether they're going to be able to save for college or not. That truck is not a bullshit light decision because some guy is jumping up and down with balloons on a Sunday while you're trying to watch football. And, and if Ford or Chevy or anybody else would step, step back and say, you know what, how do I solve that family's problem? I don't care about a quarter percent interest. How do they actually care and say, I want to create a marketing program that actually solves that family's problem, that makes their life better? The other thing that causes us to lose trust is we lie. I picked on Comcast and DirecTV earlier, but I think this is the biggest lie in um, advertising. What's a 13-letter phrase for marriage proposal? I have absolutely no idea. He went to Jared. He went to Jared. <laughs> Jared has thousands of loose diamonds and hundreds of settings, so you can create your one-of-a-kind ring at Jared's, the Galleria of Jewelry. So, jewelry is also an easy, uh, uh, is easy to pick on. But if you think about that, what does that say? If you go to the mall and buy a ring, I'll marry you? That's amazing, I wish it was that easy. Uh, you know, in uh, half of me, you know, every kiss begins with K. If you buy me jewelry, you get sex? I mean, this, amazing, you know? And, and so too many of our ads and too many of our, our things are, 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 are lies and, and, it, and it causes us as consumers to just tune out. What's a 13 letter phrase? Sorry about that, guys. So. What this means is we have to shift into a new mindset. We have to get into a place where the future is going to be something that none of us can predict. Um, this morning, how many of you guys saw Adam Harrell speak about uh, the future user interfaces? Well, we don't even know what screens are going to be like. You know, what, you know, there's the there's the merger of man and man and machine. There is, you know, a, a potentially a screenless world that's coming around. There's all these different things. But we what we can know is that we live in the age of an empowered consumer. 
And we need a new, you know, we don't need a roadmap, we need a new philosophy. So the first piece is let's embrace the art and science of our, of our craft. Now, <clears throat> when I say this, you know, and there's a lot of talk about data, data, data. There was actually a piece that came out about Amazon uh, today who I think uses data better to market than probably any brand out there. And they were talking about the limitations of data. Um, so, you know, it's the art of storytelling. It's the art of data science. It is research. It is analytics. It is all of these things that our craft was built on. When you think of a, a typical account planning mindset, you know, we get away from that because everything's fast, fast, fast. Let's get an ad out there. You know, oh my God, we got to get this out there because our competitor tweeted this and we need to Instagram something. You know, it is the art and craft of, or the art and science of our industry. But that's just not enough. That only gets us a part of the way there. Um, we also need new values. Uh, we need to go beyond simple understanding. Like I said earlier, it's, it's, it's one thing to know the demographics, the psychographics. It's one thing to understand the targeting, the behavioral, the interest-based, the, all of those things. And even the best marketers today are going to things like hopes, dreams, motivations, fears, goals, objectives. But that's not enough. That just tells us the what. That's all that does. If I know that Sarah is between 30 and 50 and has children and values education and likes walks on the beach and to read, and even if I know that she visited all those sites, that doesn't matter. Even if I know that she went to Amazon and added something to cart, that still doesn't matter. We're still thinking in terms of transactions. We're not thinking in terms of relationships. We have to go from understanding to empathy. And we have to go from empathy to compassion. Compassion is our secret weapon in this new world. And that sounds sort of crazy. You know, we're, we're about to enter this like crazy, highly technico technological, I can't speak today, uh, technologically advanced world. We're about to, you know, have more information at our fingertips. We're about to have this internet of things where you can do things with your fridge and, and just amazing stuff happens, right? But that's where it's easy to get lost. We have to actually care. How many of you guys have Amazon Echo? How many of you guys have those old things where you can put the Tide thing next to your washing machine and hit the button? One person. That's amazing. I actually thought nobody would do that. Uh, <laughs> my, my guess was nobody. I thought, I thought a few hands would go up for Echo and no hands would go up for the Tide button. Um, but, you know, that, the Tide button's technology. Amazon Echo represents understanding. Um, we also have to move beyond clicks, impressions, and conversions for our KPIs. And I know that a lot of you think that's blasphemy. A conversion is what we're after, right? We want to convert. That's what we're paid to do. I mean, if you're a marketing manager, you're getting conversions. Um, I think those KPIs limit us. You know, um, and the challenge is brands measure their marketing teams and brands measure their agencies on things like traffic and impressions and share of voice and, trans and conversions. But that, that limits us. Um, where did we go? Yeah. Um, what we need to start thinking about are relationships. Instead of lifetime value and lifetime profitability, we need to start thinking about our shared existence. So in 19, if you look back like 30 years, 85% of the Fortune 1000 is gone. They're gone. How is that? Size isn't a... Um, protector of, of your existence. Size an indicator of how successful you're going to be, right? What happens is we end up in these cycles of short-term thinking, transactional thinking, of conversion thinking, and we stop thinking about what a brand means to somebody. You know, one of the things that is interesting is the, the most valuable piece of real estate is in our head. You know, if, if I'm going to let a brand into my mental universe, that's probably the most sacred place it can be. And right now we have more choice than anything. And, and, and consumers will throw you out of their mental universe in a split second. So what typically happens with brands is they get big and they start doing things that, like DirecTV. And DirecTV has been sued by like so many states because they just lie to you. You know, like, hey, $19.99, $29.99, whatever. 
And then you find out it's really a lot more. But that's short-term thinking, right? Because what happens is right now we're trapped in a world where we have basically two choices, a cable provider or direct TV. But that's going to change. The moment that changes, we all run for the hills and like the hell with them, right? And that's the point is we have to move beyond this and start thinking about what it means as a brand and as a marketer to coexist with consumers. Not try to convert them, not try to just maximize a transaction, but build that relationship over time. Because that's what we're doing here. We also have to prioritize customer experience over traffic. Um, <clears throat> this is another short-term thinking piece. You know, every time we talk to a client, it's always about bringing more people into the store, bringing more people onto the site, bringing more, more, more. You know, and you, that isn't always the best thing to do. You know, I think um, Zappos has built an entire business on looking at customer experience. That is not me. I don't know what that is. Let's see here. Can I push a button? anything so it's gone. all right so anyway what we tend to look at for user experience is also limiting we start thinking about landing pages and websites and we start thinking about how stores flow and we start thinking about things but we always think about it from the customer acquisition standpoint we don't think about that entire experience you know post purchased you know customer support all of these things and the customer experience trumps traffic every day of the week. We also need to be able to tell the truth. And I think that I, I picked on a couple brands earlier for telling the truth, but I think Pizza, uh, Domino's, I started saying Pizza Hut, uh, Domino's did a brilliant job of telling the truth. Have you guys, how many of you seen the Domino's campaign? So I won't show the video. Uh, but it's amazing because simply by telling the truth and saying, hey, our pizza's not that good, we're committed to fix it and being open and transparent fundamentally change their, change their brand. It changed their sales. And we need to stand for something. Going back, this is more of a sort of a rant for a second. How many of you guys want to target millennials? Good. Nobody raised their hand. Um, well, what's funny is everybody's wanting to target millennials. And I would say millennials are like 70 million people. That's like targeting France. Um, not really a very tightly defined uh, group. But millennials and people in general want brands to stand for something. You know, brands that stand for something, even if, you, if you're against it, you understand it. Brands that stand for something, brands are having to transition from this fixed entity of just selling products and services to actually being a part, like I said earlier, of our mental universe. So standing for something, and it doesn't have to be puppies, it doesn't have to be for whatever is important. And, and, and those, are one of the those are some of the things that we're going to have to shift um, because just having a sugary glass of water isn't going to be enough to take us into the next, throughout the next century. Um, this next one's something I think that um, we talk a lot about. We end up as marketers and brands so focused on getting new customers, we don't give enough love and attention to existing customers. I think that this is maybe, you know, we've been in business 11 years. I think giving love to existing customers has been brought up to a client maybe twice. And that's insane when you think about it. I think that we should treat our customers, our existing customers, better than potential customers. And it should feel something like this. I sit here alone by the river with thoughts of once I never knew your name. Mm -hmm. And it feels
somebody that you've been giving, I've been giving, I'm not going to pick up my uh, natural, my mobile phone provider by name, but I've been with them for at least 11 years. And every time I call, they hate me. Why can't we give our existing customers more love than we give potential customers? Part of that next piece of my philosophy here is, is we need to be authentic. Um, and being authentic isn't just telling the truth. Being authentic isn't just being relevant, but we have to understand a brand's limitations. I didn't put the screenshots that I was looking up, and I actually stopped looking them up because I was afraid my browser history would judge me. Um, but I was looking for brands on Facebook that I really wouldn't fan, uh, you know, and. You know, everything from, you know, there's all kinds of like Tanactin with the foot fungus and stuff like that to uh, all kinds of plumbing services. And you're like, I don't really want to fan my plumber. Uh, I like my plumber, but that's the sort of a weird thing to do. And if I have nail fungus with little monsters in there like the commercials, I probably don't want to fan that either. Even if I get a coupon, you know, I just don't really want to do that, you know. Uh, and so, so part of being authentic is understanding where, what, what, a, what as a brand you can actually be in somebody's life. If, if I wear Hanes T-shirts, you know, they're going to occupy some mental space in my mind if I'm loyal to them. But there's a limit to what that can be. And sometimes as brands and marketers, we don't respect that limit. We don't embrace that limit, and then we lose trust and we lose credibility because we try to push beyond that. We also need to try to earn people's trust instead of just convert. How many people have ever felt like a brand's really worked for your business? Do you always sort of feel apprehensive? You get the retargeting ads, you add some jeans to cart, and it's like 25% off, and then the next day it's 30% off, and the next day, you know, you see more jeans that you didn't really look at before, but they're new colors, and I don't know about you, I'm not, I'm not a hipster enough to wear red jeans. Um, Adam, my uh, Nebo's co-founder, can pull off red jeans like no other. Um, I can't. Uh, so showing me those ads are sort of useless. Um, but the point is that they're doing the least they can to earn my trust. And we, ha we have to flip that as a mindset. And I said this earlier, but we really need to value the relationship over revenue. Revenue is short term. Relationship should be forever. If I'm a brand, I want to grow with somebody. I want to grow with somebody. No amount of retargeting, no amount of keywords, you know, uh, there, there's, you know, I could write a thousand articles that are SEO friendly. That doesn't build, build a relationship. We need to do those things, but in the, th but we need, if we're going to write an article, it should be because we want to help that person's life, not because we think Google will reward us. You know, to sort of bookend this, we're entering this age of consumer empowerment. Marketing has to change. The definition of marketing has to change. We can't do the same things. We can't just spend billions of dollars buying ads, putting home page takeovers in people's faces, you know, having stuff pop up on our phone while we're trying to use an app. We have to get out of that mindset. The consumer's smart enough, they don't have to have a full mobile ad to know how that we're there. 
you know, and, and marketing is a beautiful profession, so our challenge is really to regain the public trust. And that's what I'm here to talk about, is to say, uh, is to say, it is up to us to rebuild that trust. It is up to us every time we're going to launch a campaign, is, is this ad true? Are we overpromising? You know, is this something that would truly make our customers' lives better? So, lastly, I think that this uh, video is a good example of, instead of showing people how to, instead of blasting people with ads, instead of trying to force people to do things we want to do, as marketers, we need to teach. can take the mindset of that that dog and say hey our job isn't to force it isn't to coerce it isn't to blast with ads it isn't to keyword stuff it's not to create better homepage takeovers our job is to enable customers to make the best choices that make their lives better we don't want to be the cat anyway thank you guys very much Does anybody have any questions or comments or? Because we can end this early. <laughs> sure. I guess I ask, um, you know, I, I understand what you're saying and I, I follow and, and support a lot of it, but how do we make that leap with our clients? Our clients have a certain mindset. They've been in the ivory tower for decades. How do you get them over on the other side of the fence? I think that's hard. Um, I think it's really hard, and we've had to have some really tough conversations with clients. Um, there's two things I tell clients. A, we're not maliciously obedient. Um, I'm not going to uh, uh, do something that I know is wrong just because a client said so, and I'm not going to be paid to fail. Um, and you can't just make those two blanket statements. But what you can do is show people the data. You know, uh, a little bit of a, she's not here right now, but our director of uh, search engine optimization, Stephanie Wallace, um, she's always had the philosophy that, you know, you don't pray to the Google gods, for example. You don't chase the Google alg algorithm. You create content that helps users. Google will catch up. And, and that's worked very well for us. So if you have some examples like that, that they can show a client because clients, most of them are logical and will say, hey, I want to be on the better path. I want to be, I want to be ahead of things. Some, they're not going to be there. They don't care. We had a client one time. 
<coughs> excuse me, and uh, it's Fortune 100 client, and we were doing really good work, driving a lot of conversions, um, and we recommended tying the um, conversion engine to their CRM so we could better understand the value of a customer. And our um, point of contact said no. And I said, why? He said, I mean, because it didn't make sense. You know, they had one lead that they knew they had that was worth like $2.5 million, just one lead. So why wouldn't you want to know that? He's like, I don't care. I'm bonused on conversions. Or excuse me, I'm bonused on traffic. And I do think that, you know, you do run into that. When you run into that, you just let it go. You know, you either choose not to work with them or you say, hey, you're probably not going to uh, be there forever. Um, but I do think that sometimes we have relationships where we treat each other like we're B2B entities, but we're really human. I've never met a person in my entire life that wants to wake up one day and say, you know what, I helped Goody sell a lot of hairbrushes in 2013. This is not what you want on your desk, on your, on your, it's not what you want to be remembered by. So, other questions? Anything, comments? Sure. Well, two things there. A, um, I think that in this industry, whether it's digital marketing, whether it's just advertising, um, if you're not, if, if the people that are doing the work aren't part of the sales conversations, th that's fraught with peril in general. Um, I think that that's, that's, a, that's a challenge. Um, I think that one of the things that we sort of evangelize is stop looking at paid media campaigns and SEO campaigns as a semantic exercise you know, coffee cup, big coffee cup, white coffee cup, and start looking at it in terms of the buyer journey and build out your campaigns as if it were the buyer journey because people don't necessarily think like a Dewey Decimal system. Um, so with, with the question of like, hey, how do you, you know, there's one conversation in sales, there's another conversation as a client, I would bring all that research to bear and bring recommendations. So even if you're not a part of the sales pre process, if you can do some research and understand what that buyer journey may be like and bring that to the table earlier, you're probably going to A, be more effective, but the client will respect it. Um, because this isn't a technical exercise. This isn't a grouping exercise. People think that a lot of times paid media or SEO is, is, is you know, um, there's a, um, the process is grouping keywords and writing ad copy and lowering, lowering bids. That's not what it is. It's an exercise of communication. Putting truth to ads is so, it works so well. One of the things that's sort of funny, if you can go to Google right now, we could probably pick any industry and all the ads look the, same, look the same. So putting a little bit more work makes a world of difference because you're actually saying, I give a, I, I care about the consumer. I'm not gonna just, you know, keyword stuff in the uh, title tag because somebody searched for that and uh, have a generic template. So I think, I think it really comes back down to, you know, if, if you were selling bottled water, you know, if, you th if, you, if the first question is, what do I care about? How can I get into the shoes of somebody? Is more important than all the keyword data. Yeah. What other questions do people have? Comments? You can disagree with me. Jake? Uh, I was going to say, I noticed you were very cautious around the steps there earlier. And you were kind of tense us if we were more the dogs or the cats. <laughs> well, I don't know if this is... Um, good user experience, but the steps are immediately behind this, and um, I, uh, I don't know if it would have made the presentation better or not, but I almost fell. <laughs> it would have been memorable, at least. Anything else, guys? It would have been the dogs. You would have been the dogs. I think you would have been the cats, because I, I was, I think somebody should have just said, hey, you know, watch out behind you. Uh, uh, so I think you were, I think if I had uh, fallen, it would have been tweetable. Uh, anything else? All right, thank you guys for sitting in and have a great day.